this place was built on. That's what our community is founded on. Don't act like the example, just be the example. This is the home of the greatest fitness community in the world. We're trying to create strong, able bodies, resilient to injury with a gas tank to get shit done. If there's one thing from this podcast about taking media action, find the problem, fix the problem, this is your opportunity. It's either a hell yes or a fuck no. It's that simple. You really have to take one podcast. Now is the time to take action. Now's the time to do more and be more. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome to the Tango One podcast. I'm Tony Smith, retired, retired cop and SWAT team leader. I'm the owner of the Garage Gym Tango One Solutions. Uh, and my mission every week is to kind of introduce you guys to people in my network that'll help you guys take action on your problems, your weaknesses. Simply put, I want to help you to do more and be more. Today, I'm like really pumped to have a guest here, Mark Megna, coming all the way from Miami. Mark's a former pro football player, played both the NFL and the CFL. He's the co-owner of Anatomy, a health and wellness sanctuary in Miami, uh, and One Hotel is a mission-driven hotel brand. Uh, Mark has his own podcast. He's also done a documentary uh, on his life story called The Just a Kid from Fall River, and he's the author of Dream Big and Never Quit. So, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show today, man. Thank you very much for having me on the show. It's an honor to be here, Tony. So, I really would like to just start right with almost like the, uh, you know, Just a Kid from Fall River. How on earth did you get from small town Massachusetts to the NFL and now Miami? I know that's a huge, uh, probably a long story in itself, but you know, where did it start? Well, I, I'll tell you, uh, I grew up in uh, Fall River, Massachusetts. Yeah, I was raised by a single mom. My mom raised my brother and I by herself. Uh, my grandparents jumped in here and there, but it, it was certainly hard. I, I know you're a parent and it can be hard. Uh, we were talking about that off air, but being a parent can be tough. Being a single parent, I can't even imagine how hard that is. Um, I just wanted to stay out of trouble when I was a kid. I knew my mother was struggling and I wanted to help her. Um, I wanted to ease the burden by being uh, a well-behaved young person. At times I was, at times I wasn't. But the thing that I struggled with as a young boy was I was very uh, out of shape. I was obese. I was fat. And... You know, kids are hard, you know. I think bullying is not good. I think kids picking on other kids, you know, it, it comes with the territory. It's a part of growing up. But I think what I what I dealt with was a little bit too much. And, you know, I, I, I was that kid that went into his room and, and locked himself in his, in his room for many, many months and didn't want to see the world because I was so depressed and I know there's a lot of kids like that out there. And I would have probably remained in that room for a long time had my grandfather not stepped in and said, you know, you can, he asked me what my problem was. And I said, I can't go to school because I get picked on and bullied. And I was, I wasn't a tough kid. I wasn't strong. I was out of shape. And my grandfather said, well, if you get strong, you can protect yourself and, and you don't have to worry about that. And I said, that's impossible. Look at the way I look. And he, he took me to the gym, literally, to the local Boys and Girls Club. And he helped me transform my body. And he invested so much time in me. And I hated the gym. But it really, the torture and the discomfort started to feel good because every time I walked out of there, I felt better. So I was riding that endorphin high and uh, I, I felt better about myself. And then I started like months and months and months later, I started to see my body change. And through a consolidation of those acts, I started to feel better and look better. And, you know, that the rest is history. I, I started to play sports and I went from a kid who doesn't get to play to a kid who was hustling around and running around. You know, and I'm giving you the expedited story, but I can't tell you how many times I sat in my room crying and just felt like, you know, the, the ugly duckling and, you know, it is what it is, but a lot of kids don't recover from that, you know, and I had my grandfather and I had a mother who believed in me 
you know, my mom took me to the doctor when I was six years old. The doctor felt my knees and my ankles. He said, your son has very big bones. And then she told, he told her that your son's going to play in the NFL for the New England Patriots. And, you know, you want to talk about a powerful seed being planted. Every day of my life, my mother told me I was going to play football for the New England Patriots. So I played youth football for the Little League Patriots. And I, was, I wasn't even good enough to say I was terrible. I was so bad. I mean, I couldn't even make it around the goalpost for one lap. I was so tired. So I did that, and I rode the bench, and I just liked going out there. I liked being a part of the team, you know, and, and I knew I wasn't good. I knew I couldn't play. I knew I couldn't block. I couldn't tackle. I just couldn't. I, I wasn't good at those things. But I understood to get where I want to be, I have to do all of this work. And I don't know how or why I understood that at a young age, but I did. So I went to work and I went to the weight room every single day. I ran like three times a week and the weight melted off and I became known as a hardworking young person. And I'm going to tell you, Tony, every youth coach I had told me sports weren't for me. Like every youth coach. So, you know, I know every kid wants to be a pro and a star. I didn't want that. I just wanted to prove my mother right and kind of show other people that it's possible, you know. That's so, insane, that, that, so the doctor makes this, this extraordinary claim. And at that point, you, you're not even like getting on the field, let alone playing. And you just like set your, I mean, it's almost like a, like one of those goals that you just, you say it out loud and eventually it starts to happen. You find a way to do it just through the hard work. That's pretty incredible. Now, yeah. Don't you think like uh, with the bullying, so I was, you know, I'm not someone who struggles with my weight. I'm very fortunate in that regard, but isn't it kind of like, it must be, I, I feel now from being in a, the fitness industry and, you know, being a cop and dealing with bullies, but being in the fitness industry now is I feel like, those are the same people that were helping, man. The, the people that don't feel good about themselves that want to be locked in their room and not come out. I think that's what, like, your gym is a lot about culture from what I read and from what I've heard from some friends. And I think that's what we're doing for the industry. Do you think that it really helps you to relate with people since you've kind of been there and done that? Yeah. I mean, anatomy was created. Um, it started off as one thing. And myself and my business partners, they... You know, I don't, I don't think we, we had kind of an idea, but, you know, I, I certainly don't think we knew what we were getting into, but more than anything, quickly, we figured out that we didn't want a gym, we wanted to build a community of people, and that's exactly what it is today. How many times have you walked into a fitness facility where like you're a confident man, you're a cop, you're, you know, you're, you can hold your own, but there's always someone that's trying to give you a hard look, intimidate you. That's what it is. And it's not like that here. You know, I, I can't remember, I can't tell you how many times I've walked into gyms. I know we all do this thing where we travel and we go to the gyms, we check them out and we like different things. It's like gym culture, gym culture. But I want people to walk in and say, you know what, Mark? I got to tell you, this is the most uplifting, positive, friendly environment I've ever been in, in regards to fitness. And that that's that's a huge thing to me. You know, we say, you know, if you're constantly thinking about, you know, if you're a team member at Anatomy, you're constantly thinking about what can they do for me? I want more. I want more. Now, granted, everyone deserves more. You know, if you work hard, I think you deserve more. But the perspective of, from the people we have, their perspective is more, what can I do to assist others? And what can I do to add more value? And it's not like, I don't expect anyone to work for free and I expect everyone to want to make money. And I know that's a big part of life. I respect that. I mean, listen, I, I was cranking out 
a lot of sessions when I first started training. And it wasn't just to crank out sessions, it was because I wanted to, you know, refine my craft and I wanted to help people and I wanted to work. But at the end of the day, before all training, science, programming, assessment, the most important thing is people. And if you are by nature a selfish person, you just can't be on the team. You just can't because it'll be a toxic energy. And we've had that here before. It just doesn't work out. You know, we need good, committed people who have clean hearts and are doing the very best they can each and every day. And the job isn't easy. But now we, we really have a special team. Their heart's in the right place. They're doing the best they can, and they want to be better. And that's all you can ask for. Yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, you're, you hit that nail on the head there for me. With, I mean, when we were picking the, the, our SWAT team, it wasn't always a vote the best or the, the most proficient, the best shooter or the fastest runner. A lot of times it just came down to who will fit into this group of people and make us better as, as just people. And then the, the team will kind of rise up from there. When you started off on this, like, wasn't it, I, I found when I started off my business, it was just the hardest thing was to kind of, uh, to get that first or second hiring. Because I felt like both of those were desperation hires and it was very hard to like, Hit by values, and I, sh- I sure learned the hard way. Uh, did you learn any lessons like that where you would kind of like wish you would have done some things a little bit differently when you first started up in terms of building that team? I mean, there's, I mean, I could write a, another book about <laughs> you know, my mistakes. Eh? You know, this just this from, I think, you know what happens, Tony? You, 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 you have this idea, and Someone would come to me and they say, hey, I want to open a gym. And my, my honest reaction is usually don't open a gym. And people, you know, and you would think, well, why would you discourage someone else from doing something that you wanted to do? Well, because now I actually have information that I didn't have before. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do. And I firmly believe if that's your dream and goal, you should go for it. But you have to understand what that means. Like you're going to sacrifice time with your family. Now I'm not talking about a little time. I'm talking about 90% of your time is gone. Like it's gone. Like if you're concerned about your marriage, it's just going to get worse. You know, and I'm not saying it can't work. I have an amazing wife. And if it wasn't her, I probably wouldn't still be in a relationship because she is so understanding. She's so supportive. But just what happens when you, you're starting, you want to make it so badly, and you're just trying to hold on. You're not, you know, I have this expression, you're not here to survive things, you're here to take charge of it. Well, early on, we were surviving it. We weren't taking charge of it because we didn't know what we were doing. And, you know, we want men, you want members, you, you want trainers to be, working as a team, you want them to give good, great service and great programming and great training, but you can't do any of those things if you're closed, right? So you're just trying to stay open and because you're working long hours, you're sleeping very little, the responsibilities and all the things are piling up, the stress ball that it creates, it creates this almost negative attitude And the hardest part of the job is keeping your mind in the right place where you're still optimistic, you're still positive, you're still bringing a wonderful energy. And there was a period in there where I didn't do any of that. I mean, I was the complete opposite, you know, and the people who were really close to me, who helped me and you know, some of my business partners, my business partners, not some, my business partners, like I wasn't doing well by them. And I always want to like not let people down and show them that, you know, they can depend on Mark. And I wasn't really doing that because I was in a negative place. So I would say the best advice I could pass on is you have to do everything possible to put your mind in a positive place where your perspective doesn't become negative or toxic. Like you're there to serve people. Serving people is not easy. 
but it's all about what can you do for others? Who's the most important person in the room? Not you, it's the other person. Remember, it's not easy, but that's what you signed up for. Yes. If you want to, you know, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, man, I, I, I couldn't agree anymore. You were asking me a little bit about fatherhood before we got going. And I think you hit it there, like it's fought, whether it be fatherhood or leadership or building a business, like if you really truly go with that mindset of serving others, you're gonna be, you know, heads and tails above everybody else. I did a class, I did a speech today or a little talk in front of a high school group. And I think that a lot of people like entrepreneurs like ourselves, not like ourselves, other entrepreneurs are putting out there that you don't have to grind it out. You don't have to work. Like when I was building this business, I was working 12 hour midnights, just sleeping for an hour, kissing my kids and the, and the wife and then heading to the gym to train people just to repeat that right. over and over again. I, I, don't, I think that like that process is being lost in the messaging that a lot of people are giving out to these young people. And I hope that's not, I hope they're seeing through that or listening to people like you say that that's what needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, as you know, the less you sleep, the worse it gets. Like, you, you, you can't catch up on sleep. We all know the importance of sleep. You know, Matthew Walker from Why We Sleep, he says the, the most important thing that he's ever said in his book, on a podcast, Joe Rogan, he said, the people who sleep less die first. That's it. That's all you yeah. need to know. So if you're not paying attention to sleep, we say we love our families, we love our kids, we want to make the business work. But if you really love your family, you want to be around, you better get some sleep, right? Yeah, and then you get like Parkinson's and all these other things that come without sleeping. And you know, there's a stat that cops after they retire die within five years. And it's got to be tied into that, that terrible shift where we're sleeping, right? And I, I think it's my thing. So tell me this, man. Uh, You've been coached by someone that you, like the ground a huge NFL fan, and you, you know, you I want to take a pick your brain a little bit in the whole leadership. And you've been coached by some of the best that have ever, you know, coached the game, in my opinion, from the outside, from looking from the outside in, Marcells, Pete Carroll, Bill Belichick. You know, what are some of the you know just some something cool you could give us, or what are the best lessons and takeaways from some of those guys? Yeah, you know, it's between Coach Parcells, Belichick, Pete Carroll, Dick LeBeau, my college coach, Jim Reed, who's one of the greatest coaches. I know he's my coach and I'm biased, but this guy coached for like 55 years. Oh my God. The guy's, he's a legend. You know, he's won like 19 conference championships, went to the national champ. Like he's just, I mean, those guys, they, they know, you know, body psychology, behavior, how to motivate, who to motivate, who to push, who to back off. They know that they have reps upon reps upon reps of different types of personality and, you know, what I, what I learned from each one is, is pretty vast, uh, vast, excuse me, vastly different. But, you know, Bill Belichick, you know, people think it's funny, but that guy has one, one rule, one mission. Every decision is made for the betterment of the team and keep the team moving forward. That's it. That's it. You're like, I can't believe they're going to cut Tom Brady. Well, if you don't remember, but at the time, it wasn't going very well. So guess what? Before it goes terrible, he's shopping them around, you know. And I'm and I I am the world's biggest Tom Brady fan. He was my teammate my second year. But at the end of the day, if it's not working, you distribute the parts. And Bill Belichick, the reason I like, I'm not going to name names here, but I had another coach who said. Hey, Mark, uh, you're doing great. You're really kicking ass out there. Way to go. Keep it up. Well, that guy cut me, and which is messed up because if I knew what I was doing wrong or what I need to be better at, I probably would have busted my tail to be better at it. Bill Belichick would walk over to you before the game and say, look, you're here to play special teams and be a reserve linebacker. If you don't make special teams plays, you're going home for good. He would tell you that right before the game. And he's not trying to intimidate you. He's saying, look, if you really want to play here, figure it out, make some plays on special teams. And the guys that rise up, guess what? Those are the guys that can be trusted to play in front of 80,000 people. So, 
you know, they it's it's a you're a police officer. So I can only imagine what it's like with the pressure and the stress. But uh, it's not life and death like your job, but you feel like it is. I promise you, you feel like it is. And the the amount of stress and pressure, I mean, they, that's why athletes end up drug users, alcoholics, popping pills. It's a lot of pressure. You know, if you don't do well that day, you're going home that day from practice. Forget about the game. So, and it's like that every day of your career. I had a guy who I'm very close with who was with the Patriots the last five years. And I talked to him on the phone and he said, you know, Mark, I, it's the worst quality of life I've ever had. Like it's so much stress. And I asked him, I said, let me ask you a question. How many Super Bowls have you been to? He said, two. I said, how many rings you have? He said, two. I said, you have two Super Bowl rings. I said, do you understand the percentage of people in this world that actually played and earned a Super Bowl ring? And that might seem like no big deal, but it is a big deal. Especially when you started playing football at six, you played in Little League, high school, college, pro, and you played in the Super Bowl and won and wear a real Super Bowl ring that's yours. He has two. And then you have guys from other teams saying, nah, I'd rather not get a Super Bowl ring and have a better quality of life. I, I don't understand what that means. Like, I, I, I understand the pressure and, I, and it's real. But at the end of the day, you know, Oof. it is what it is. You know, I appreciate the honesty. I appreciate the tough coaching. And listen, they, I don't know if you know this story, but this is a real story. It was a game time situation that Tom Brady's trying to get, pick up, you know, uh, first down. It's third down and trying to pick up first down. They run quick outs to Randy Moss. Randy Moss catches the ball out of bounds and they don't get the first down. Well, sure enough, they do it and they go back to the film and he stops the film and says, I have a hall. I have a, can you hear me? I have a hall of fame, hall of fame receiver and a hall of fame quarterback and we can't even get an effing first down. On third and four quick outs. He says that in front of the whole team. So you never get, you're never above the law. You you are never free of harm. You are never out of harm's way. If And that's the greatest player that ever lived. And it wasn't a joke. It was real. It was serious. So and everybody takes it as so, right? Like that, I mean, oh, that's yeah. set the standard as high as you can, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Stand by. Stand by. Does your financial advisor take the time to really listen to you? Is your financial strategy personalized for you and your family? Will your financial advisor be there as your life and financial situation change? When you work with Stephen Kidd, your local Edward Jones financial advisor, he focuses on what's important to you. You work together and use an established process to create a personalized financial strategy backed by the advice, tools, and resources to help you reach your goals. And you'll partner to help your strategy stay on track. Contact Stephen Kidd today at 519-734-8599. That's 519-734-8599. Edward Jones, member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. This is episode of the One Podcast. is sponsored by Ian and Kara Murray of Murray Insurance and Financial Services in Kingsville, Ontario. They are Southwestern Ontario's number one ranked Desjardins insurance agency by their clients and they're owned by our very own Kingsville OGs, Ian and Kara. They pride themselves in maintaining the high standards that the garage members have come to expect. They are experts in their industry with a combined over 100 years of experience. They are the best customer service in the industry, including claims concierge service, which is exclusive to their clients. And they focus on community, something that's very important to us, employing local team members and investing back in the Essex County community on a continual basis. They are a one-stop shop for everything to protect you, your family, and your assets with the best policies in the industry. And if you combine your home, auto, and other insurance policies together, you get an even better rate. 
Give their team a call today or send them a text at 519-733-2331 or check them out online at murrayinsurance.ca or on Instagram at Team Murray Insurance. We are, Casey and I are proud members of Team HQ. That's HQ Nutrition. You can use code TANGO15, that's capital T-A-N-G-O-15 on your online order. Go to hqnutrition.ca, use that code and get 15% off your entire order. That's incredible. So when you were, you know, when you were towards the end of your career and your, your fight, was it like, were you fighting to stay alive and get in there? Or were you just kind of like, I want to, you know, like I, I can see it in your face on the, the stress, like you're telling the story, it was like, it was like you're refueling some of that stress. Was it like almost like a relief to be on your way out? Like when it was time to go from being a football player into this, this new industry that you did, or was it a bittersweet? It was bittersweet. I mean, when I, I was, after my last season, I only played, I was on a practice squad, I played two seasons in the NFL, and then I went to the CFL, um, and I had a great, like, I was very happy with my career in the CFL, I had, it was a lot of fun, we won a great cup, um, but I hurt my back very badly, and it's like, you never leave happy, right? My friend says, football is like a love, like, it, you can love it, but it doesn't love you back. And, and you get frustrated because when you're, I remember I was playing for Montreal and my first year in Montreal, we go to the Grey Cup and win. And I'm a CFL all-star. I have all these sacks. People think the world of me. I'm, the, I'm that guy, you know, and I'm feeling good about myself. And the very next year I got hurt. And then it was like, uh-oh. You just go from feeling so good about yourself and being so praised and to being a nobody like overnight. So it, it's it's a lot, you know. I mean, there's no feeling like that. Like you you're you're you you make a at, you know you do Tony. You're practicing these drills and you're lifting weights and you're doing sprints and then you make this play in in. A one second span, you think about all the crap you did your whole life to move that way and reach out and grab someone and pull them in. And you save, make this awesome diving play. And it's like this jolt of adrenaline. It's like this. No, I mean, I've never done a drug in my life, but I don't care what anyone says. There ain't no drug like that. There's nothing like that. And I hear people try to try to make all these things say, this is like that. And I'm like, have you ever played in front of 8,000 people and made a play like that? You know, so I don't know. I yeah, miss I it. I understand that feeling that you're saying, man. Like, you know, I, there's, there's anything I miss from policing. It's that one big adrenaline dump. You know, that moment where you feel like, you know, this could be it for me. I'm like, maybe that's a, this is the time to end it. And then to go... You know, it's a normal person life and just come around and be a dad, which is supposed to be so brilliant. But that one, that's the one piece of energy that I miss. And I can, I mean, watching you describe it, I can see it in your face that you're ready to uh, put the helmet on and smash the face. But oh, yeah. how was the, tr so what was the transition time? How did you go from, so you're in the CFL, playing for the Alouettes, and now you're, you know, you're, in Miami, owning a gym, like what did, was that a goal of yours, or did that just kind of come like naturally with your, you know, your fitness level and stuff? We skipped a big chunk of, uh, oh, I'd say, of learning experiences to say the least. Oh, <laughs> fill me in, fill me in. You yeah. go where you want with that. I left. I left Montreal. I went to Miami. I started working a job where I had to wear a suit every day. It was basically like selling advertising. It was an absolute nightmare. Uh, I was training people. I was training myself. Uh, I was training in a corporate gym. The general manager of the gym said I should be training there. I would do well. And I, I had my certification. And I started training people there. And I started off with no clients, started training people for free, just like everyone does today. And, but I tell all, we have trainers here are called body architects. And the ramping phase of being a trainer is very challenging. And I tell them all the same thing. There's going to be a period where you're going to say, this is hard. This is a nightmare. This sucks. It's not going anywhere. I can't believe I'm doing this for a living. 
Like if you, in, not in those words, but you're questioning, you're just questioning yourself. And I was working from like, you know, 5 a.m. to 10 o'clock at night. I did that for many, many years. And I learned more about myself going through all that stuff than anything I learned on a football field. You know, just sticking with it. My, I went from playing in front of large crowds and feeling really great to re-racking weights in a corporate gym. And I said, you know what? No matter what I do in life, you have to commit to it. And I just figured out, I'm, it wasn't like I'm going to be the best and I'm going to do it. was like, you know what? I'm going to commit to this wholeheartedly. And I don't care what anyone says. I'm going to focus on being my best, delivering the best service, learning as much as I can. And whatever happens, happens. So, you know, I, I went from being like the 13th, 1398 trainer in the company to it was like top 10, uh, 20, and 13, and 10, and just cranking out sessions. And then I started to think, there's no way I can reach the amount of people I want to reach just training people all day. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. But I had, I felt like, Mark, you have some knowledge. You have some leadership skills. Why don't you try to lead a team? And so at the same time, I was also working at a performance facility called Bomberito Performance. Shout out to Pete Bomberito. The guy's uh, super intelligent. He's awesome at what he does. I learned so much from him. And uh, so then, you know, we put together the plan and built out anatomy. And that was very tricky. I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot in there. That could be a podcast and a book. But slowly but surely, we started to build the community. And, you know, we... We, we, we figured things out a little bit, a little bit, I think, and um, had a training team of people, had great service, just had a very cool, special, unique vibe energy at Anatomy. And then we built another one in uh, Miami City, and we're building one in Coconut Grove. We have a very large one inside the one hotel. It's like 12,000 square feet. Um, so... They were, I mean, the detail, you'd have to like watch just a kid from forever, the documentary on iTunes or, or Amazon or the book, um, Dream Big, Never Quit. If you read that, you hear a lot of the, I mean, it, it was hard, man. It, it was hard. I remember a lot of dark days and you just like staying the course and not losing your energy, your positive energy, and your light. I mean, you know how it is. It's hard, man. So it's hard to do that. Everyone says, stay on course, but it's not about staying on course. It's about how do you deal with all the curveballs thrown your way when they're thrown your way? You know? So. Yeah, we're going to we'll have those, uh, those books, movies, we'll have those links in the audio and the uh, files. So if you guys want to check those out for sure, Mark, I know you only got a few more minutes, man, so I want to hit you up with just, a, just like one more question. So if you were going to, you know, for one thing, you talk about these dark days, you talk, I mean, you got some, some badass skier records, and that's, you know, that puts you in a dark spot, you know, uh, NFL, like maybe uh, being cut, all these different experiences where you felt like the low man, and I see you all, you, you're always on the Instagram, you're always like uh, giving plugs to the guys who are cleaning, the guys and girls who are cleaning your chins and keep things spotless, and I think that's probably, you know, because you've done that job and appreciate it so much. So when you were in those lowest moments or the darkest days or the curveballs are coming at you, what's the one thing that, you know, the one like shining light that always kept you moving forward? Because I think if there's anything from a little bit I know about you, it's that like your hard work ethic and just driven, 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 continue. Could you pinpoint that at all, you think? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, Look, it, it, it's certainly not gone. It's certainly not gone. But for years, like, you know, people say, well, you had a big ego and that's what helped you get where you are. And, and I think there's some truth to that. But I think, like, my ego over time, like, it just kind of wore me out, man. And I was like, I'm just, just so sick of certain things. And I think I realized that.
we are all where we are in life because we receive help from other people. And, you know, I'm just so grateful for having a mother that cared enough to keep me away from trouble. You know, she never spoiled me with things. Uh, she couldn't, but my point is like, getting those hard lessons as a young person, understanding the value of a dollar, understanding that no one's walking through the door that's gonna save you. Like you are in this and you have to keep your head up and do the best you can each and every day no matter what's thrown at you, no matter what happens, no matter what energies, negative energies come your way. And you just have to keep picking yourself up. I make a joke all the time. I don't have a lot of skills. I'm gonna be honest, Tony, there's a lot of people on our team that are much smarter than me. But I understand that to do something special, you have to keep getting up and return with the same vigor, positive energy and enthusiasm that you started with. And if you can do that each and every day, and it's not easy, it is not easy, but if you can do that each and every day, things work out, things always work out. I'm not talking about you know, financially, monetary, I'm talking about you will feel better about who you are, where you are, how you do things, and the key to life is making an impact and helping other people. I know it sounds cliche. I know it sounds like fluff, but I'm going to be honest. When I help other people, I feel like a better human being. I feel better. My days are better. I sleep better. You know, I can look other people in the eye and say, look, this is what I would do. And here's why. You know, it's not like when you run a business, people think, we, we, we have a guy that used to uh, be a part of the team. He's no longer a part of the team. And one of our members said, you know, Mark, uh, this guy messaged me and said, I'm glad you still believe in the culture there. And it was kind of like a negative, passive, aggressive shot. And I remember thinking, I felt bad for this guy in that moment because the whole time he was here, it went right over his head. Meaning you can't get anything from something you don't buy into. Like he could have got so much more kindness, love, care, help, support, opportunities, whatever it is. Because when you come to anatomy, it's not, hey, just help anatomy, help anatomy, help. It's not, it can't be like that. We want people to do well if they're here or if they're not here. That's a fact how they handle it, like you can't leave a trail of flames in your wake. You have to be a class act. You have to be caring. You have to be considerate. You have to remember what it was like when you started and you had nothing and all the people that conspired to help make you what you are today. And it's not because of anatomy. It's certainly not because of Mark Magda. It's because you worked hard, but a lot of people put you in a position to be successful. And I think the key to life is remembering that. Remembering that when you have all the things you wanted, when all of those things worked out, it didn't happen by yourself. There are no self-made men or women. You were helped, just like I was helped. I can't tell you how many, my mother was working three jobs. You know how many people picked up the slack for my mother? Between my grandma, grandpa, um, my coaches, I mean, I didn't have a father, but I had 12 coaches that I was their son. We both know, Tony, those coaches get paid, what, $300 a season? They make nothing, right? But then it's, they're taking care of 20, 30, 40 kids like they're their kids. And then parents got the, got the you know, balls to go scream at them at a game. Like, they're, they're coaches. They're, they're babysitting your kids. You know, so just remember the people that helped you. So when you're in that position, you can look back and pull others up. That's the most important part, man. That's a great way to put it, man. That's a great way to 
to kind of clean up that in, in this uh, podcast and stuff. And, and isn't it, that's exactly the reason, like, people like me and you, I think, go back and coach and go back and like, take the time to sit down with, you know, with coaches and with other people and support to coach kids to get an influence in that. And it's exactly that. I mean, I'll tell you, you talked about adrenaline, Mark. The one thing that I think matches the adrenaline for me of jumping off a building or smashing in a door with a machine gun is giving back to somebody and that feeling that you get when they are just so grateful because you did something for them with no no recourse for yourself. I mean, uh, that's a great way to put it, man. Huge respect to you, and I, I appreciate you coming on here and sharing your story. Uh, if thank people want to get a hold of you, how do you do that? Say that again, I'm sorry. If people want to get a hold of you, I will put it in the show notes, but how would they do that best? Uh, 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 you know, I'm, believe it or not, I know it's for old people, but I'm on <laughs> Facebook, um, <laughs> Instagram, Mark Magna on Instagram. I don't know. Um, and Anatomy on Instagram. So follow the gym. Uh, we have amazing instructors, amazing, amazing body architects, great leadership here, good, great people. Um, I'm so proud of all of them. Honestly, they, they're doing something so cool here. Like I'm, I'm so proud of the entire team and my business partners and just everyone. Um, get the book, Just a Kid from Fall River. Uh, excuse me, the book, Dream Big, Never Quit. Um, I wrote the book. I had a lot of help editing that book, but it's, it's, a, it's a good book. I just put up the audible version. Uh, so you can listen to the audio on audible.com, download the book. Uh, the documentary, Dream Big Never, uh, geez, I told you it's the middle part of the day. The documentary <laughs> is, is uh, Just a Kid from Fall River. You get it on iTunes or Amazon. And that was created by Randy West of Monarch Productions. And that documentary was not built or made or, or uh, put together. So Mark could pound his chest. It's put together to show kids, people, specifically at-risk youth, that you, know, you can make something of yourself. It's not going to be easy, but it's possible. And if someone like me can do it, then anyone can do it. So it's meant to inspire and, and help people. So... Check it out. Good, man. Mark's got a huge following on Instagram and stuff. And this is, we call people influencers. And that it's a negative thing a lot of times. But Mark, you are an influencer in the right way, man. And you do it for me and so many others who follow you. You're always seem to be taking the high road. And I appreciate that. And we appreciate the fitness industry. Uh, you're one of the good guys that's putting up the stuff that makes us all better for it and makes other people better for it. So thank you so much, Mark. We're going to cut it there. We're going to stop this recording. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Now is the time to take action. Now is the time to do more and be more. 